Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your mercies towards us. You are so kind in your goodness. You watch over us. And with the psalmist, we can say that you are our rock and our refuge. Father, it is so good to come before you to worship and to pray and speak with you. And we ask that you would lighten our hearts from your word and speak to each one of us according to our need in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We confess to you our sins and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus Christ there is assurance of the forgiveness of sins and that we may rest upon that assurance. For you, Lord Jesus, have done great work for us. You have brought about our salvation, taking upon yourself the punishment that we deserve And you have paid our debt before God, that we might be released from all of that. We ask then, Lord, that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit in righteousness and in holiness of life, that we might glorify you, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Our reading today comes from Acts chapter 19 and verses 1 to 10. Let us hear God's word. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. 
Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can bring to you our requests and our prayers and that you hear us. You love us so much and you wish the very best and very highest for us. You will lead us through this life and you will bring us into that eternal glory where we will live forever. And so, Lord, as we come in the midst of this world and of its sorrows and difficulties, we want to pray for others and ask your blessing upon them. You have told us to pray for our enemies. And so, Lord, we think of those who may have ill will against us for no cause. We ask, Lord, that you would turn their hearts from evil. We thank, Lord, of those who may hold grudge against us. And, Father, we ask that you would help us to examine our own hearts. If we have done anything wrong, let us obey your command to go and to fix it immediately. And if, Heavenly Father, a grudge is held against us for no cause, may we be as open and as willing as you are in your tremendous grace to give forgiveness from our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you lead us and that you guide us in life. We ask for your help in the week that lies ahead of us, in the duties that we have to perform and in the work that we have to do. Lord, give us courage to carry it out and help us to do our very best in all that we need to do. And may we, Lord, seek to do good and to honour your name as we live our lives in this coming week. Heavenly Father, we pray particularly for those who are ill at this time. We think of those who are suffering from COVID, uh, Lord, from the President of the United States and his wife, uh, all the way to folk much closer to home in Northumbria and to uh, folk here in North Ar- Northern Ireland who are suffering at this time from COVID. Lord, we pray that you would bless them and strengthen them, encourage them in spirit and mind, as well as healing them in body. And we pray, Lord, for those who work in medical care around them. We do pray too, Lord, for those suffering from other illnesses and those who suffer from continuous and ongoing restrictions and pain. And Lord, we ask for your blessing, comfort and encouragement to them, that you would strengthen them in their inner being in Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we pray too for your guidance to leaders both here and across the world the leaders of nations and of communities, that we might be able to walk with you in humility, to do what is right and just, and that we might be able to live together in peace. Heavenly Father, we pray for your church, for all its congregations, great or small. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that you work all things to the good of those who love and serve you, And so we pray that you would do so, that through this present crisis with COVID, that through all of the things that happen in the world, you would lead your people. Heavenly Father, lead us from triumph to triumph, building your kingdom, letting your reign be real in our hearts and minds and lives so that the world can see it. And help us, Lord, to encourage and build one another up in our most holy faith. Through Jesus Christ and to his eternal glory we pray. Amen.
We turn again to the book of Acts, and in the last chapter, last week, we learned of the work of Apollos in Ephesus, and uh, then he moved on to Corinth and uh, uh, worked there. And so this passage begins that as Apollos was working in Corinth, Paul returned to Ephesus as he had promised the people there he would do if God willed it and permitted it. And so God did. And so uh, Paul came to Ephesus and Apollos was working in Corinth. And we'll see that that's uh, an important setup uh, for the continuing mission. This is really the beginning of Paul's uh, third missionary journey. And uh, he has Ephesus as the center of that mission and works from there. Though, in fact, he moves out from there during the years that he's in Ephesus uh, and uh, uh, works and ministers in other places. And there are other churches started from Ephesus. Three things happen in these verses that I want to draw your attention to. And I want to draw the three of them together in your mind. First of all, Paul baptizes some men who had been baptized by John the Baptist, and he baptizes them, Paul baptizes them into Christ Jesus. Secondly, in Ephesus, Paul leads the Christians out of the synagogue again, as he had done in Corinth, and they begin to meet on their own. And for two years, Paul ministers in Ephesus and Apollos in Corinth, and the Christian church becomes known and established throughout the whole province. Those three things, then, I want us to think about and draw together in our minds. And two words sum up what I have to say to you. Real and kingdom. Real and kingdom. So keep that in mind. Nothing happens until it's real. In the three things that I've drawn out that happen in this passage, we see this. We see, first of all, that Paul begins that interior journey. He travels uh, across land uh, towards Ephesus again, as he's promised. And when he arrives at Ephesus, he finds people who actually are in a similar position to Apollos before he met uh, um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, they are Jewish folk who have come to the Jordan and are baptized by John the Baptist, but they know nothing really about Christ or his work or actually the beginning of the church with the Holy Spirit's coming. And so these about 12 men, uh, Luke isn't always um, uh, exact when it comes to figures, um, but uh, about 12 men, about a dozen men, Paul uh, ministers to them and is speaking with them. And he asks them, well, wait a minute. As he talks to them, he realizes they don't know about Christ, and yet they are believers. Well, what are they believers in? They are like Apollos. They are believers in the call of John the Baptist to repentance, and that Israel must repent for its king is at the door and is about to come in, and they must uh, be ready for the king. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the king. And so they, they know that, and they were actually baptized by John the Baptist uh, into that repentance from their sin. And so Paul says to them, but what about the Holy Spirit? Now that's an interesting question for him to ask. What about the Holy Spirit? You know, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but when he who comes after me comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I baptize you with water as a symbol that you've repented from sin and you've left it behind and now you're washed clean. But when he comes, he will do something entirely different and greater. He will bring the Spirit of God himself, who is God himself, to dwell upon you, wash over you, and be a holy part of your life. I can baptize you to say that you have decided to repent of your sin and be ready for the coming king. But when the coming king comes, he will actually carry out the transformation. He will wash you in the Spirit of God himself, and you will be surrounded by and cleansed by and changed by the Spirit of God. 
And Jesus, when he sent out his disciples, told them first to wait for the Spirit of God to come upon them. And at Pentecost, the Spirit came. And we have seen through the book of Acts that wherever the church opens up a whole new door of mission and ministry, then the, as the apostles open that door, then again the Holy Spirit is given in a similar but not as great a way as at Pentecost. Well, Paul has come to Ephesus and he has found these believers in the coming Messiah who are ready to hear of Jesus but haven't yet. There's about a dozen of them all looking for the Messiah, living there in Ephesus, presumably attending the synagogue, in which Apollos has been now and has preached as well. But these men, for some reason, have not heard and taken it in. Paul says to them, what about the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't heard about the Holy Spirit. So even their knowledge of John the Baptist's teaching wasn't complete, because John the Baptist had spoken of it. They had gone to Jerusalem at some time. They had gone to the Jordan. They'd been baptized for repentance. They were hoping for a coming Messiah, but really their faith and, and knowledge doesn't seem to have gone beyond that. And for the first and only time in the whole of the book of Acts or the whole of the New Testament, we hear of someone being rebaptized because they are baptized again now into Jesus Christ. So little was their understanding of their original baptism that they are actually having to be baptized as if the first baptism had never occurred at all. It isn't real until it's real. This teaches us, you know, that you cannot separate the truth about Jesus Christ from baptism. Baptism has to be in the truth of Jesus Christ, or you're just putting water on. It isn't real until it's real. And for these 12 men, although they had repented of sin, they knew nothing of salvation. They didn't know what salvation really was. Paul said to them, well, how were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized with the baptism of John. And he says to them, but John's baptism was to lead to Jesus Christ. And they don't seem to have understood that until Paul told them. John's baptism was just a preparation. Now, generally, they didn't rebaptize people. Apollos was not rebaptized, though he had been baptized by John. And so we learn this, we, we learn it and take it in. It's not real till it's real. You can't separate the act of baptism from the teaching and the truth about Jesus Christ. You know, you can talk about the order in which you have to get the key to unlock the door. And then having unlocked the door, you, you open with the handle and then you push the door and, and that opens the door. But until you do any of that, the door remains locked. It isn't real until it's real. It's not real until it's done. And the reason that's so is because there is a real thing that has to happen. Merely baptism without a true acceptance of the truth is just water. It must be under the truth. And when these men know the truth about Jesus Christ, when they know not only that they are repenting of their sin, which, after all, Judaism told them to do, not only are they repenting of their sin, but they're repenting of their sin to Jesus Christ. They're trusting for the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ and in his death and his resurrection, in his payment of their debt, when it is real to them that they are forever setting aside their old way of life and now coming entirely under a king who will reign over them, who is Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross and has lived in the world, was raised 
and ascended into heaven, who reigns from there when they realize they are entering into the kingdom of a living king whom they will now serve. Then they are baptized into Jesus Christ washed not in some sense to, oh, I'm turning the back and the bad things I did only. That's just self-will. That's saying I'm not going to McDonald's anymore because it makes me fat. That's self-will. Repentance to Jesus Christ is trust that what Jesus has done in coming to the earth and placing himself upon the cross has paid the debt for your sin. We are baptized into Christ, washed into him. We are not just leaving something, we are joining someone. We're signing up to be his, and it's not real till it's real. But for these 12 men, when they accept this and Jesus Christ as both their Lord, their Master, their King, and their Savior, then the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And like at Pentecost, and like the other times that we've seen in the book of Acts, where a new door opens, For these 12 men, the Holy Spirit falls upon them in speaking in tongues and in prophesying, in speaking out the Word of God. There is a great work and action. That's not always the case with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we see the Holy Spirit come in the book of Acts before, after, and and, and in different ways. And the reason I say that is It's not real till it's real. The point is there is actually the Holy Spirit. And this isn't a power or a magic. This is God. And you are to be baptized in God. And he does that. He does that. It isn't real till it's real. But here's the other side of that wonderful truth. In accepting Jesus as king, the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes. Your sin is forgiven. And God washes you in his Holy Spirit and makes you his. Forever. Forever. It isn't real till it's real. And so a work has begun at Ephesus that is, in some ways, a remarkable work alongside the work that has begun elsewhere and began uh, with the first coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And we'll see that there is, as I said last time, a kind of watershed in the work as Paul goes to Corinth and then Paul goes to Ephesus. Then he goes on to complete his vow to God because God comes first. When you're in God's kingdom, the king comes first. You serve him and nothing else. And then God directs him all the way back through the interior where he meets with many Christians and builds them up and has built up himself and the churches are growing and strengthening and he comes to Ephesus and a new work begins with him and Ephesus and Apollos and Corinth, a work that for years begins to utterly stagger, and we'll see more of it as we read on in Acts, begins to utterly stagger the world uh, of, of the Gentiles around. A great work has opened. The second thing which occurs is that Paul leads the Christians out of the synagogue to meet on their own again. Paul always began in the synagogue, and he did when he was first in Ephesus, and when he returns to Ephesus, um, he continues to do so, preaching in the synagogue, and is there uh, for quite a while. And remember, Ephesus uh, Jewish folk asked him to return and asked him to come and preach uh, to them. So he continues to do so until things change, and there are stirrings of trouble Um, For about three months, he's able to speak and preach in the synagogue, uh, which actually 
is something of a record for Paul in the book of Acts, but for three months he gets to preach and speak, and then there is a stirring amongst the Jews against it, and they begin to malign the way. The way is one of the uh, terms, or the term that was used for Christians and for the Christian truth before the, the word Christianity kind of caught on. And so Jesus said, I am the way, and they begin to malign the way. They begin to speak against it. That is, the Jewish uh, leaders, teachers there begin to speak against it. And as soon as Paul sees that, he then withdraws from the synagogue. And he does what he did in Corinth. And he goes across instead uh, to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, uh, about which we know something. It uh, opened at 11 and uh, 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 Paul would have been there to speak and to teach, and it was a, an open lecture uh, hall uh, to be hired out, and, uh, and uh, it seems to be the place then that Paul began to speak and teach, and people came to hear him. And the church went with him from the synagogue, these 12 men and others, and they began to set up. And so you now have two independent from the synagogue churches, one in Corinth and one in Ephesus, um, in the center of this, this province, uh, two important places within the province. God is moving. And Paul seems to have taken in seriously now, in a very deep way, that God's work is not beholden to the organization of the Jewish faith. Actually, God's work is never beholden to any human organization. Paul preaches in the lecture hall of Tyrannus of the kingdom of God, persuasively arguing, as Apollos is in Corinth, that there is now a king upon the throne and that he calls you, everyone, to join him, to be part of his kingdom and to accept him as your personal king, lord, and saviour to be baptized, washed in the Spirit of God, baptized in water, and become part of his kingdom. It's not real till it's real. And walking away from the synagogue, which must have cut Paul because he longed for the Jews to listen. And walking away from the synagogue, Paul was saying exactly that to them. If this fellowship isn't real under the king, then we are out of here. With the 12 men, if your personal faith isn't real, if you haven't joined the king, then it's not real. For a fellowship in worship, if it's not real, can't be fact. We are under the king. He directs because the Spirit of God washes his people. And the third thing which happens in this passage is about the power and growth and work that both Apollos and Paul have. As each is ministering, these uh, well-versed men in uh, the uh, Bible and the Scriptures, as they are teaching in their respective cities, the whole province begins to hear of the message of Jesus Christ. And the Christian church becomes established in people's minds and thoughts with the lecture hall of Tyrannus and the house across the way from the synagogue in Corinth. It becomes established and associated with the teaching and the preaching of Apollos and of Paul of Tarsus. It becomes established that when these folk become Christians, it utterly transforms them. And they, they change, they step away from whatever they have been in. And they, you know, to, to step away from the synagogue for Jewish people was a huge step. And to go across and, and to worship in the lecture hall of Tyrannus and to listen to Paul, that was a big step. For people who were coming from the Greek world away from the worship uh, of gods, as we'll see uh, in uh, later chapters, it was a huge step for people to take. 
when it's real, it's real. And God confirms this work, as we'll see in the coming chapters. And so as Paul and Apollos are preaching, there is a sea change, both in the way that the church is thought of by those outside of it and the way that the church thinks of itself. The church begins to realize, and we'll see this more deeply as things go on, the church begins to realize that to be under this king makes differences. Differences in what we did before. It's not real till it's real. Here's what I want to to end with these three things. Here's what you do. See Jesus, really. The scriptures say you are he. You are the one. You are the first and you are the last. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning with God. The Lord Jesus, who is holy and true, holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. We have a king in heaven, and we are joining him and his kingdom. See who he is. Secondly, repent. Numbers 12, we read this. O my Lord, please do not hold against me the sin in which I have acted so foolishly. Acknowledge your sin to the Lord, confess it, and repent from it turning from sin to set yourself to take Christ as your Lord, Master, and Savior. Make him king. Proverbs 4. May I guard my heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. That is, may I guard my will with all diligence. Matthew 6, may I not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Be ready, for the Son of Man will come at an hour when I do not expect him. The King is coming, he is returning, and we are his, we are his people. If it is real, make it real. Make him your King and serve him. And to sum up from 1 Peter Chapter 4, from Peter, that man the Lord had to struggle with so much in the Lord's early uh, earthly life. That man who at the end thought he'd be the big guy and stand up for Jesus, but actually denied him three times, which the Lord knew. That man who was reinstated to care for the sheep of Jesus Christ. He writes this. May I not live the rest of my life in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For I have spent enough of my time in the past doing the will of those without God. I have spent enough of my time. When it's real, there is something real to come. It is the Holy Spirit upon us. The Holy Spirit in us, God, we are part of his kingdom in Christ Jesus. And he does come when we know and trust in Jesus Christ, when we uh, repent of our sin and trust in him for the forgiveness and say, I'm away from the way I used to live and my life is not my own, it's yours. You're my king. You're my Lord. I'll do what you say from now on. I just want to be part of your kingdom and do what your kingdom wants. I want to be in that kingdom and I want to be a part of that real fellowship. By being that fellowship myself, I set myself to be yours. It's not only to turn away from, it's to turn to and become part of his kingdom for that is what Christ came to set up. To be washed in the Holy Spirit in God himself and to live for him forever. It's not real 
until it's real, just like everything else in life. But when it's real, like those 12 men, like the folk who went with Paul across out of the synagogue, like the people who would hear and see the reality of Christianity at work in Corinth and in Ephesus. When it's real, it's really real. Make sure it is in your heart and mind. We said last time, God comes first. Make that real. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that this is something real for us to really be washed in and anointed with your Holy Spirit, to truly become part of the Savior of the real King, whose kingdom is the only one that will last for all eternity, to be carved out from the rock by your hand, to be made your people and your children. Lord, we bless you for the reality that you offer and give to us. We repent of our sin, and we come to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You are our King, our Lord, and we will serve you to the glory of your name and by your grace. Let it be so. Amen.